So our topic is going to be the philosophy of the will, right? This is a particular uh, a group of philosophers that they weren't necessarily part of the same school. They weren't necessarily, uh, you know, always dealing with, like, sort of relating to each other, but they were all sort of exploring a similar question. Now, philosophy is a pretty big topic, right? You know, uh, who knows what philosophy means, literally? Anybody know what the word exactly means? Love. <coughs> love of not oh, wisdom, actually. Wisdom. Sophia, yeah, yeah, uh, sort of philosophia. It's uh, mm. the love of wisdom. Uh, not necessarily knowledge, and, there, and there, there's a slight difference there, right? Um, we can know a whole lot of things and be completely naive, right? If, you know, we can know facts and not necessarily have, uh, have wisdom. But philosophy, when you think of it in these terms, um, you know, it's a search, it's a, it's a question, it is asking the big questions. And uh, I, think, uh, I think nowadays we tend to think of like philosophers in a very stereotypical way, right? Or like even a sort of a wise man in this sense. When we think of a philosopher, like, is there an image that, that, that is in your mind? Like a guy caricature? Guy in a bathtub in the middle of a square. What's that? Guy in a bathtub in the middle of a square. Classic, that's a gr classic Greek philosopher. Yeah. Um, well, who, who else has got a sort of image of a, of a philosopher? I almost dressed as one today. I decided against it. I was going to do like the black turtleneck with the, you know, with the yeah, blazer and the like beret. <laughs> yeah. Kind of semi-run down, pre-war building, you know, lots of books. Cafes, smoking the cigarettes. Yes, everything is meaningless. All that kind of stuff. Black yeah. horn rim glasses. Things, yeah. <laughs> Old. I don't know why. And in previous in, in previous centuries, there were other stereotypes that were and the whole like sort of fashions that were that are sort of related to philosophers. Now I mentioned that at the beginning of this that you know, and I'll re repeat it again. I'm not a, a professor of philosophy. I don't have a, a chair in a department at some university or something along those lines. The good news is, neither was anyone else pretty much that we're studying. There's a couple of exceptions to that, um, but for the most part, uh, most philosophers that were actually good weren't teaching at schools because the schools tended to be very conservative in terms of their thinking and did not like to sort of break out of it. Think of it, if you're, if you're going for tenure, the whole, the, the game that you're playing is essentially don't say anything that any of my superiors will disagree with, right? So a lot of these guys were really, really opinionated and that didn't work out so well for their academic careers even if they tried. And, a lot, and several of the philosophers we're going to go into did try to have an academic career and it held pretty spectacularly, uh, like Nietzsche for instance. Um, so, and many of them weren't even really appreciated until either late in life or even after their deaths. So that's kind of what we're getting at. But, so we're getting into these hard questions, um, you know, and I think that really anyone that is concerned with these questions and tries to answer them is a philosopher. I kind of open that up pretty broadly. You don't have to have a degree in it um, to be a philosopher. And a lot of times, again, that academia can be quite stifling for people who are looking to answer these questions. So what kind of questions are we talking about? We're talking about, like, who am I? What am I? What does it mean to be a human being? What is, why is the world how it is? What is the good life? What should I be doing with my time and my life, etc.? These are questions that have a lot of crossover with religious and spiritual questions as well, right? And a lot of times, you know, you can you can certainly be um, both a you know a religious figure and a philosopher, as one of the first people we're going to be reading was. Um, <coughs> so it's a pretty these, these anyone who's sort of engaging with these questions is philosophizing, and if you make an attempt to answer them, I would say you're a philosopher. I'd say that probably many people, if you're if you're you know, interested enough to come to this class, probably have asked these questions, and probably have tried you know making sort of tentative stabs at answers or reading other people who have made made other stabs at the answers, right? So I think everybody here is probably can, be, can can sort of fall under that idea of a philosophy. Now, we're talking about a particular question. And we're going to be looking at a sort of train of thought that surrounds a question. And it's deceptively simple. This is the question of the will, right? the idea of the will. Here is a definition that I found from a dictionary of philosophy um, on the will. The power to control and determine our actions in the context of our desires and intentions. The power to control and determine our actions in the context of our desires and intentions. Believe it or not, that's actually not where we're going. <laughs> we're going well beyond this because some of the guys that, we, that we, <coughs> we're studying take this idea of the will and sort of expand it in some really interesting directions and bring a lot of other stuff in. And there's a lot of questions that surround this idea of will and volition that are going to actually reveal a whole bunch of stuff about human nature that may not necessarily have something directly to do with the question of making a decision and acting upon it. That's sort of <coughs> more kind of colloquial understanding of, of will in that regard. Um, 
some of the folks that we're going to be dealing with uh, are really interesting figures and uh, not always extremely well regarded. I should also mention, uh, probably should have said this from the, from the first, this is not a yogic philosophy class. Right. So if you're looking for yogic philosophy, sorry, I, I, I'm going to get a little bit of that next, uh, next session uh, when we deal with Schopenhauer, but this is essentially a Western philosophy cl uh, class. And we're going to be dealing with, mostly with Western philosophy. And the guys that we're dealing with uh, can be a little extreme. Right? Can be a little extreme. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if uh, some of you guys have some, uh, even if you've never read Nietzsche, have an idea of his reputation. Right? What do we know about Nietzsche? Anyone have a... Yeah. God is dead. Yeah, the God is yeah, dead is the classic. That's the, the classic, uh, yes. the abyss and like all this, you know, yes. Yeah. You know, if you stare into the abyss, the abyss looks into you and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, it seems really dark and it seems kind of, I mean, like several of the guys we're dealing with were, were, uh, were atheists or very close to it. Um, and, uh, you know, they lived some pretty extreme lives oftentimes. A lot of them were pretty curmudgeon -y, you know, like they were sort of, uh, you know, sort of kind of bitter people, uh, kind of recluses and kind of gone off into, into their own sort of, like hid from the world in a lot of ways. Uh, you know, Nietzsche uh, went insane halfway through his life and, you know, ended his productive career, uh, spent, you know, 10 years under the care of his sister. Possibly for syphilis, we don't know exactly what happened there, but, uh, you know, and Schopenhauer uh, was kind of a jerk, and you know, he didn't like anybody, and not many people liked him either. Like, so you know, and like F Freud, for instance, who we're, we're going to be going into, and we're, he he sort of picks up this current as well. Um, every one of his proteges ended up like they ended up hating each other. Like it was, it, kept, it happened over and over again. There was a repeating pattern in that. Um, so these are some extreme folks. But if you think about it, like, you know, in terms of yogis, yogis are pretty extreme, too, right? If you think of the, the, the whole philosophy of Patanjali, of, like, withdrawing from the world and kind of, you know, sort of, you know, pulling back from the everyday life. It's an extreme thing. All of the lives of every, every saint in every religion are extreme. And the, the biggest thinkers, you know, and the, the, some of the most profound thinkers in history have been, have lived very extreme lives and have taken extreme positions. This, I think, is really useful for us. This is the same reason that psychology uh, has a tendency to focus on abnormal psychology first, at least in the history of, of, of the development of the discipline, because it's easier to see an extreme, right, than it is to see subtle variations between people. You know, if, you know, it's easier to ask the question of why that person just, you know, uh, you know, stripped himself naked and is running around Route 6 and screaming about the end of the world than it is to say, well, this person has a, you know, seems to have a question of meaning in their lives. And uh, it's, it's easier to focus on the, the loud, the, the, the out there. And for our purposes, it allows us to find a sort of middle ground, even if we don't want to emulate these guys. And I think for most of us, we don't. Right? Certainly, we don't want to emulate a lot of their outcomes. But their thought is invaluable regardless because they focused so intently on it. They spent more time thinking about these questions probably than anyone here, including myself, will ever, right? You know, years and years. So when we see these extreme personalities, it's important, I think, not to sort of to, to judge them for that, ex that sort of ex extremity uh, and that, that sort of... Uh, that personality, and sometimes even their hyperbole, right? Like the God is dead is a little bit of hyperbole, I think. As we get into Nietzsche, we'll see. It's a little more subtle than that. Um, so as we kind of get into that, we're going we're gonna to come, I want to share a little bit of uh, one of my reasons and how I came to this particular, interest in this particular topic. Um, so this is a guy, I don't know if anyone, he, he, tell me who, if anyone's heard of him. Alistair Crowley, who's heard of this guy? Okay. What do we know about this guy? The most evilest man in the world. Yeah, yeah <laughs> the worst yes, evil yes. cult. Introduced you to the West, sort of. No, well, no, he didn't. No, he, um, didn't. he introduced it to me, however. Yeah. Yes. The, West well, of, the Western yeah. part of the Western <laughs> part of Dave. <laughs> yeah, the Western part of Dave. So oh, wait, um, this guy, uh, this guy, Alistair well. Crowley, uh, he he has his, he he was a mystic and uh, among many other things, um, mountaineer, poet, um, British spy during World War One. Um, he did a lot of things in his life, but he was this kind of a this extreme mystic. And he has a pretty freaking bad reputation, partially because of the Fox News of his day, the Daily Mail, <laughs> which went to war with him. It's, no, seriously, it's, it's ridiculous. He has this reputation, he was literally lambasted by the, by the, the British press as the wickedest man alive. And this is, we're talking about the period in where Mussolini and Hitler and uh, all these other <laughs> yeah. things. So I mean, this is the early part of the 20th century. He, he's the wickedest man alive? I don't think so. <laughs> yeah. I don't, he, he didn't do anything that, that was that extreme, really. It was just his reputation, and a lot of it was because of his loudness and the extremeness of his own life, right? And he had no pro he did not like to hide that. He's openness. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, he was very open about his bisexuality at a time mm -hmm. that it was, you know, it was very, un you know, unpopular to be so. 
Anyway, when I was young, I got very into this guy, and it, I've kind of, it's, it's a strange thing because um, even as you know, my thought has matured, I keep going back to him in a weird way because it was, he has a very interesting philosophy. And even if I may not always you know, sort of like attach myself to that as like sort of an ultimate truth, I kind of find myself indebted to it. It's kind of like if you, if you sort of fall into anything you know, early on, a sort of way of thinking, it tends to, to sit with you and kind of, it, it, it sets its roots pretty deep. I wouldn't be into yoga if it wasn't for this guy because he wrote several books on yoga that, that were profound in, uh, influence on me early on. So I kind of got into that and he has this whole thing, his catchphrase was, do what thou wilt should be the whole of the law. And I got really interested in what that meant and what he really was talking about. And you know, I began to see the, the influences in it and I kind of took it back from him. So we're gonna end with him. It may, it may be of interest to you, it may not be of interest, but he'll be the last, very last person we're gonna discuss. And he's also the last person that showed up in, in, in terms of uh, the sort of the time period. He was the last person to die of all the guys we're going to sort of to, to deal with here. But that's not, he's not our main focus, and he, we're going to sort of touch on him at the end, because what it comes down to is he's not anywhere near as influential as the other guys that we're, that we're dealing with who were extremely more like Freud. Uh, you know, basically, this stuff is what gave birth to psychology you know, in, a, in a very real way. So there's that. As I said, they're a little on the extreme side. And I just want to give you a, there's, a, there's an excellent quote from Schopenhauer, who we're, gonna, who we're gonna start on, probably take two classes on next week, next two weeks rather. Um, just as an idea in terms of behavior, what we expect of these guys. Uh, Schopenhauer said, it is l just as little necessary for the saint to be a philosopher as for the philosopher to be a saint. Just as it, is, as it is not necessary for a perfectly beautiful person to be a great sculptor, or for a great sculptor to himself be a beautiful person. In general, it is a strange demand on a moralist that he should commend no other virtue than that which he himself possesses. All right? In other words, these guys don't have to be saints to be right, All right? to be interesting, to, tell, to be able to teach us or tell us something. So that's it. There's another thing that kind of unites these guys, other than dealing with this question of the will. <coughs> Most of them um, are typically considered pessimists, right? And we mean something a little different than this when we mean sort of colloquially. We talk, I'm not talking about a person who's just like a glasses half half damp, half damp, you know, that, that sort of has a habitual mindset of sort of saying, oh, you know, things kind of suck and they're always going to suck and, and nothing will ever work out. Not that kind of thing necessarily. Like some of them were that too. Uh, I'm talking about it philosophically. And so I'm going to give you, uh, there's two definitions that I found, again, that same um, dictionary of philosophy that are, are, I found kind of useful. So pessimism, um, coming from the Latin uh, pessimus, or worse, superlative of pejor, or worst, or worse rather. Um, definition one, the tendency to take the worst or least hopeful view of things, the opposite of optimism. Two, viewing things from the emotions of sorrow, pity, gloom, despondency, hopelessness, meaninglessness, absurdity, pain, death, and believing that these are the basic and inescapable ingredients of life. And that's the, sec the second definition, I think, is a little closer to what we're gonna be dealing with with some of these guys. And then a slightly different uh, uh, sort of definition coming more from the, the, me the metaphysics of pessimism. One, the view that all things are ordered for or tend towards the worst. Two, the world is essentially evil and will remain so in spite of human effort. And three, that this is the worst of all possible worlds. <laughs> Cheerful <laughs> stuff, right? Yeah. The fact of the matter is, this attitude is the centerpiece and really the, the foundation of most religions. I'll give you some examples. The book of Ecclesiastes, or, uh, or in the, uh, in the, if it's in the Torah, it, I usually think it's called um, the teacher or the preacher. Um, I have seen all the works that are done under the sun, and behold, all is vanity and vexation of spirit. That which is crooked cannot ma be made straight, and that which is wanting cannot be numbered. I communed with mine own heart, saying, Lo, I am come to a great estate, and have gotten more wisdom than all they that have come before me in Jerusalem. Yea, my heart and great experience of wisdom and knowledge. And I gave my heart to know wisdom, and to know madness and folly. I perceived that this is also a vexation of spirit, for in much wisdom is much grief, and he that increaseth knowledge increaseth sorrow. Or as the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali puts it, to one of discrimination, everything is painful indeed due to its consequences, the anxiety and fear over losing what is gained, the resulting impressions left in the mind to create renewed cravings, and a constant conflict among the three gunas or qualities which control the mind. Similarly, in, uh, in Christianity, from John, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. 
For all that is in the, in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will, the word, the will of God abideth forever. So there's a hint of hope at the end there. Yeah. But it's saying essentially that the world itself is not a good thing. And this is true for Buddhism, right? Sarvam Dukkham, everything is suffering. Everything is of the nature of pain, right? That w one way or another we kind of get in that direction. When we think of a wise man, I'm going to use man here because it's sort of dark table in this regard, but wise woman as well. When we talk about this, a person of wisdom, what do we think in terms of their behavior and their interests? Are these people chasing the things that the rest of us are chasing? No. Not in the world. They almost know it's not worth it. Yeah. There's an assumption of this, and I think it's kind of all over the world. There's this connection to this notion that there is, that the world is not quite as it appears naively. Right? I think at first, when we sort of deal with the world, we look at it as a source of great pleasure and excitement and all this sort of stuff, and it eventually kind of wears down for us in one way or another, eventually. Some, some sooner, some a little later, but it, I think we usually kind of come to this notion. So if we understand that this idea of pessimism is not really a new thing, it isn't a sudden kind of like, well, these guys are, are discovering that the world sucks. No. This is something that goes back thousands of years, and it really it seems to be connected to the human, very human reaction to the suffering of the world and towards these things that were defining that idea of pessimism. To go back to it, you know, the viewing things from the emotion of sorrow, pity, gloom, despondency, hopelessness, meaningless, etc. Right? This idea that we are responding in one way to this makes it a philosophically pessimistic idea. But it is not necessarily without hope. It is not necessarily without um, a sort of consolation, right? If we look at, you know, to, just to take the, the sort of Christian example, you'd say that the consolation of the world being this thing that passes away and, and not really being worth our time is that there is this world to come, heaven, that's waiting for us. Or in the yoga idea or the Buddhist idea, you, you know, everything may be suffering, but there is a way to end that, right? And that's sort of the Four Noble Truths. Um, this idea that it's possible to do something about it. And a lot of the philosophizing actually kind of assumes the pessimistic take, and where they differ is in what to do about it. And that's going to be very much what's happening here. These different philosophers can be radically different about what they say to do about this, in other words, the ought part of it, but they don't tend to differ so much on the is. Right? And that's one of the things that's going to, going to sort of unite these guys these particular guys. This isn't to say that there are philosophers who aren't total optimists. They exist, but there are a few. <laughs> they are a few. It's just, it's, it's true. Um, so that's kind of, you know, that's, that's the idea of, of these folks that we're going to be getting, we're getting into in this regard. That there is pain. What do we do about it? This world seems to, you know, it seems to be implied in that. And most of these guys are going to be trying to face that head on rather than emphasizing the consolation. They're going to be tending to focus a little bit more on this and why that is the case. Why is the world suffering? Right? Why is suffering? You know, why is life of the nature of pain? What what is going on here? And then what do we do about it? Right. So this brings us to a lot of different questions. There's a lot of stuff that, that can, that's going to come out of this. And you know, one of the first things I was thinking about, you know, what to start with. And I kind of wanted to jump right into Schopenhauer because he's kind of the, the first one to articulate this in terms of will in the way that he does, which is a very unique uh, kind of uh, formulation. But I think it's helpful if we start with a more general idea of will. As we think of will, we tend to think of volition, right? The ability to do something or not do something to, you know, you know, will, you know to, to, to will something to occur. And this brings us into a, a topic that I figured would come up in questions if, it, if I didn't address it directly. Free will. The idea of free will and whether there is such a thing as free will in this regard. This question is not, I don't think, particularly important. <laughs> it's not really in its own, in its own nature. And, it, and honestly, I think it's, it, it's we're going to look at two guys who, in terms of, uh, you know, in their discussion of free will, and by the time that both of them, even in the 13th century that Thomas Aquinas was writing, this was an old question, and kind of, like, everyone was kind of over it. Like, at least by Hume, certainly everyone was a little over it. So the question itself, I don't think, I think it's actually fairly easier to resolve, and I think that, you know, we'll, we hopefully may come to some agreement on that. But I'm less interested in the question and more what the question reveals and what it starts to, we start to investigate whether there's free will, we're going to come to some really interesting stuff about what is the will? How does it actually work in practice? Like, what does it mean to, to will in that, in that regard? So, 
That's that said, any, uh, any any questions or, or, or uh, thoughts on this pessimist stuff or any of the any, any uh, preliminary questions before we jump into our readings? Yes, please. Can you name a few optimistic philosophers? I would say that Immanuel Kant can be considered an optimist to some degree. Uh, Descartes can be considered probably a little more on the optimistic side. Um, Thomas Aquinas probably could be considered that, although from that sort of the Christian basis, uh, you can say that at the same time. He's not, but he tends to be focusing on salvation, so you can call that optimistic. Plato, I guess, would be a, would be a, would be a good one. There's actually not that many. <laughs> um, I like. I mean, like, if, it, and it's it really depends on you know. You might you might you can even say that Nietzsche was an optimist because he had a very world positive view, but it was in spite of all of his negativity, all about the world. Like he basically you know as we'll discover he, he you know he said like essentially yeah everything that Schopenhauer says about the world and how just cruel and awful it is is all true. But we should love it anyway and dive right into that cruelty. Essentially, like just enjoy it. You might as well. You're here, right? And so there's a lot of different responses to it. And you might say that he his is is pretty uh, is pretty pessimistic, but his ought is very positive. So, you know, I'll leave you to make up your own mind on that. As with most of us. Any, any other thoughts or questions on that? Okay, let's jump into it then. We're going to start with uh, Thomas Aquinas and this idea of and his notion of free will here. Um, the question really we have, when we talk about whether or not there is free will, what do we mean? What are we getting at? If you can do what you want. If you can do what you want, in all circumstances, right? Yeah. Could we, well, could we, let's see if we can come up, before we get into, into Aquinas, can we come up with an idea of what we mean by free will when we say it? Please. Agency? Agency. What do we mean by agency? Um, can you guide the course of your own life? Can you, if you... Um, if you see options in front of you, can you determine which one you mm -hmm. should or ought to take? Great. And that's a great starting place. Why might we not be able to do that? Because someone else's free will. So, so an external, something stopping us from mm -hmm. manifesting um, our actions. Yeah. Society, an, an external thing. So there's an external break. What else might be? Genetics say? and nurture. So you might say our physical limits. Nature and understand. nurture could both interfere sure. with free will. How so? Well, if nature by, um, so if we have genetic predisposition to certain types of thinking, um, i.e., oh gosh, uh, reproductive urges, they're pretty strong in human beings. Um, we, you know, so I can't really choose not to have reproductive urges. They're just going to exist, right? And um, nurture in that the things which uh, my parents have taught me or society has taught me or the culture, the village, whatever it happens to be, have taught me are appropriate, will select the options that are visible to my mind to choose from. So, like, it is unlikely to occur to me to go out onto Route 6 and strip myself down <laughs> and start screaming about the end of the world because I have, this is not one of the options that has presented my mind throughout the course of my existence. To, to rephrase another way of putting the genetic uh, aspect of it, you might say that, uh, you know, you you might say, you make make decisions say I I am going to become a professional basketball player and you're <coughs> four foot nine, right? Because of your genetics, that is clearly going to be a limit on that. So there's definitely you might say there's a, there's a limit on sort of the genetic factor. What are, and the, and the psychological limits you might say that we're talking about nurture in that regard, as Mark was putting it. This notion that uh, you might be socialized not to behave in certain ways. For instance, it is inappropriate to strip naked and walk into Route 6 in our culture, so it's less likely to do it, and if you did do it, it tends to be indicative of a problem, right? some, some issue. Um, and usually you might say that person probably often would, we would describe someone who was like that as crazy and under an internal compulsion that makes them do this thing almost against their will. So definitely there may be some possibilities of constraining it in that regard. So if we understand free will to be agency, to be able to, um, as Sabrina said, doing, to do what you want, right? to be able to, to, to do your will, to, do, to make those choices and to act on them, um, whether or not and how much those con there are constraints upon us is really the question that we're getting at. In other words, is your will free from cause or no. not? You're constricted by your own mind. That's another constraint. And there's a, there's a limitation of the human brain, right? There are certain questions that I think humans are going to ask, and some questions we probably wouldn't even, we've never even thought of because, you know, another, another species, if 
they were in our, you know, in, in their own sort of biological uh, apparatus, they might have different constraints. Absolutely. So, the question really, what we're getting at is, to what degree is that will free from causes, from from limitations, from necessity, as Hume would put it, and how much is it determined and constrained by circumstance, whether that circumstance is internal, natural, or societal based, right? So that's really the question that we're getting at here. So when we ask the question, is, you know, is there free will? It's not a very easy answer. It's not a straightforward thing because there's a lot of factors under that surface. Hence why I say the question is almost pointless because we, can also, we already immediately come up with ways in which the will isn't absolutely free. At the very least, we can't say that it's perfectly free. So I think that we're all in agreement on that, right? That there is certainly constraints. So how much those constraints are is would be really our area of inquiry. Yeah. I just think I would wonder, is, are the things that we feel to be arising as, out of our own volition, how do we know that those are actually out of our own volition and not due to causes? Exactly. Because a lot of times when you perceive them, they appear to be free, right? You say, like, they, mm -hmm. If you don't investigate a sexual urge, it feels like you're the one urging. Yeah, but that's if you of investigate it, you're like, wait a second, that's my biology. That's not necessarily and That's the me. question of motive. Absolutely. Yeah. Cool, yes. I, I think we're kind of what on the same page. What is your biology this. not you? <laughs> Can you tell? <laughs> These are <good> <laughs> I laugh because it's a good question. Those are good questions. If you know. Like. And I think we're going we're to head in that direction. But let's get into the reading a little bit. Because these guys are going to, I think, illuminate a little bit more, uh, a little more, more, even more questions that we'll have. And then we can maybe make a stab at answering them towards, a little bit, a few of them anyway, towards the end. So this is Thomas Aquinas. Now, Thomas Aquinas, uh, <clears throat> who's heard of Thomas Aquinas before? <laughs> A.K.A. St. Thomas Aquinas. Um, so Thomas Aquinas was a 13th century um, Catholic saint. He was a Dominican friar, which was a kind of preaching monk. So rather than being cloistered, they would, they would go out and they would preach to the world. You know, um, they started uh, very informally and becoming, uh, the Dominicans in, in particular became all about uh, education. Um, and they were the, the basically the leading educators uh, for quite some time. Them and the Franciscans who had a different approach. Um, St. Thomas uh, Aquinas was, he's considered a doctor of the church and probably is the most influential Catholic the theologian and philosopher that has ever existed, even beyond Augustine, I'd say. Um, people are still Thomists today. Very few are still Augustinians. Um, so that's who this guy is. We're talking about a medieval philosophy. This is the Middle Ages. And therefore, there are certain things that cannot be questioned, certain things that cannot be said, as we'll see. And some of this will be very obvious immediately. And as we're going to see, he quotes a, a lot of scripture as his basis. His philosophy required him, and, and certainly his position, eventually as the head of Domin the Dominican order, to adhere to Catholic dogma. And everything is going to be sort of based on that. So let's go ahead and just and, and get into reading reading this guy. Who wants? We'd like to volunteer to, to read some Aquinas. Thank you. Rock, paper, scissors? Yeah, sure. Go for it. <laughs> 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 uh, objection one. Start with Article 1. Okay. Uh, article 1. Whether man has free will. Objection 1. It would seem that man has not free will. For whoever has free will does what he wills. But man does not what he wills. For it is written, Romans 7.19, For the good which I will, I do not. But the evil which I will not, that I do. Therefore, man has not free will. So this is his organizing pattern, right? He starts with a question, and basically there's some objections to the sort of party line about whether there's free will, and then he's going to give his summation of it and then knock each one of those down individually. So that's kind of how this is, how this is gonna play out. So continuing on. Objection two. Further, whoever has free will has in his power to will or not to will, to do or not to do. But this is not in man's power, for it is written in Romans 16, It is not of him that willeth, namely to will, nor of him that runneth, namely to run. Therefore, man has not free will. Continue. Objective 3. Further, what is free is cause of itself, as the philosopher says. Um, the metaphysics. Yeah. Therefore, what is moved by another is not free. But God moves the will, for it is written. The heart of, king, of the heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord, uh, whithersoever he will, he will, he shall turn it. And it is God who worketh in you, both to will and to accomplish. Therefore, man has not free will. 
All right, stop for a moment. <coughs> Just so we can break those three down before we go on to the next two. So objection one is essentially this notion, you know, for the good which I, which I will, I do not. In other words, the, thing, the good things I, I, I think I should do, I don't do. And the bad things that I don't want to do, I do anyway. That's one. And that's what we're sort of saying, sort of saying in Romans. This is, uh, this is you know, Paul, uh, Paul talking here. Therefore, man is not free. The second notion, right, um, is it's, it's not me that is doing it. It is sort of, you know, God through me, you might say. It is not in man's power, right? Um, third is, this is the philosopher, by the way, he's talking about is Aristotle. Uh, Thomas Aquinas accepted a lot of Aristotle's propositions and continued them on. Aristotle was uh, very influential in the medieval uh, philosophy, particularly the medieval church. So that's what he's talking about. He's quoting him almost like a scripture at this point, which is very telling. Um, the idea here is that what is free, according to Aristotle, is the cause of itself. In other words, what is free must have no cause. Right? It must cause its own choice. Like if I'm going to freely choose something, I am not required to choose it. I am not forced in any way or coerced, whether internally or externally, to do so. And this is notion here, what he's saying is that if God moves the will, because it is, and as, as it is written in the scripture, then it can't be free. Our will cannot be free. These are all objections which he's going to tear apart. So, so all right, moving on to objection four. Objection four. Further, whoever has free will is master of his own actions. But man is not master of his own actions. For it is written, the way of a man is not his. Neither is it in a man to walk. Therefore, man has not free will. Continue. Further, the philosopher says, according as each one is, such does the end seem to him. But it is not in our power to be of one quality or another, for this comes to us from nature. Therefore it is natural to us to follow <coughs> some particular end, and therefore we are not free in so doing. So, there's an idea that someone who's free is the master of his own actions rather than the servant of another cause, you might say. Objection four. And then, again, going back to Aristotle, we have this notion that we can be one way or another, but that comes from some sort of nature. There is a nature there, and that is our cause. So, once again. So, moving on, who wants to read the uh, beginning of uh, his response? Sure. Much go for it. On the contrary, it is written, Sirach 15 and 14, God made man from the beginning and left him in the hand of his own counsel. And the gloss adds, that is of his free will. I answer that, man has free will. Otherwise, counsels, exhortations, commands, prohibitions, rewards, and punishments would be in vain. In order to make this evident, we must observe that some things act without judgment, as a stone moves downward, and in the like manner all things which lack knowledge. And some act from judgment, but not a free judgment, as brute animals. For the sheep, seeing the wolf, judge it, judges it a thing to be shunned from a natural and not a free judgment, because it judges not from reason, but from natural instinct. And the same thing is to be said of any judgment of brute animals. But a man acts from judgment, because by his apprehensive power he judges that something should be avoided or sought. But because this judgment, in the case of some particular act, is not from a natural instinct, but from some act of comparison in the reason, therefore he acts from free judgment and retains the power of being inclined to various things. For reason in the contingent matters may follow opposite courses, as we see in dialectic syllogisms and rhetorical arguments. Now, particular operations are contingent, and therefore in such matters the judgment of reason may follow opposite courses and is not determinate to one. And forasmuch a man is rational, it is necessary that man have free will. So in order to unpack that, we have to get an idea of the sort of metaphysics and psychology behind Aquinas and Aristotle's uh, philosophy. Because there's some implications here, right? This idea of the reason, this comparative thing allowing for freedom, that the reason allows for freedom is kind of what he's implying in, in, in what he was just saying, right? So it's important to recognize that Aristotle put forth a po uh, this proposition that there are three types, three faculties that can theoretically exist in nature. And human beings have all three, animals have just two, and plant life and other sort of vegetative forms have just one. So this is essentially this vegetative faculty, which is growth. It pushes us to, to grow and reach out to the world. A plant has that faculty, but does not have the ability necessarily to sense, at least according to Aristotle, although that 
is certainly open to debate in modern biology. Mm -hmm. um, as, it, as it turns out, Aristotle was wrong about most stuff. So, um, <laughs> at least in his, you know, his description of the, of, of the world. But he got a good start. Um, the next is the sensitive, um, which is this idea of sense uh, input and also locomotion, this ability to sort of go out into the world based on your senses. So it's this passive quality of being able to receive impressions and then to go out into the world and respond to those things. Animals can do this, and instinct is wrapped up closely in this, which is his example of the, uh, the sheep and the wolf. The sheep instinctively shies away from the wolf. The man may make other judgments. It's kind of like, you know, sometimes in class I use the example of, you know, you know, my cats will hear loud noise, and they, 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 despite, despite the fact that they know they should be safe because they've never had anything happen to them terrible from outside anyway, um, you know, they still react because that's their instinct. And humans have an easier time overcoming that, I think, than many animals do. And then the last is what, what, uh, what Aristotle called intellectual operations, um, which are operations of the reason, this, this notion of, uh, of being able to compare things and to abstract mathematics, etc., cetera, uh, all included in that. So this idea that there is a rational soul as well, and this is kind of an interesting part of uh, the metaphysics behind uh, that, that uh, Aquinas takes from Aristotle, that unlike the, uh, who's here for the Plato stuff, by the way? A few guys, right? So you guys remember that Plato had this idea that there were these, these forms and that material objects, like, you know, there's a form of the, the ultimate chair, and all chairs are bad copies of it, and this chair is just a bad copy of, you know, that form. Well, Aristotle modified this. He didn't quite buy into uh, Plato's literal take on that. Um, he tended to have this notion of, uh, of essentially something else imprinting it, imprinting a more general matter directly. And this is what uh, Aquinas is talking about. There's an idea that man has a rational soul, this intellectual soul, which has the ability of all three faculties and is independent, immortal, and completely separate and impresses matter into the shape of man, essentially. Um, it gives matter which has an inherent form form. So essentially the, the, the rest of the stuff in the body, the, the senses, all kind of stuff derives from a rational soul. And this rational soul, this notion taken from Aristotle, is because it is immortal, separate and independent is capable of a freedom of will that an animal is not. There is this notion that this rational part of the soul is capable and is the source of free will in Aquinas. And this is pretty important. And one of the things, you know, in, in the reading, you, you know, one, of the first, one of the first things he goes into is, uh, you know, it says, you know man, man has free will. Otherwise, counsels, exhortation, commands, prohibition, rewards, and punishments would be in vain. Right? It kind of has to be. Otherwise, we have to call out a whole lot of stuff in the question. After all, if there is no free will, if, if, if this is not the case, that there is this soul that is perfectly capable of freedom, and that the rest of the stuff is, you know, that, that, that when we don't act according to the good, it is a, uh, a, a, a sort of a, a confusion on our part, then something like sin is meaningless. Salvation is meaningless, because we can't choose to not sin or to sin. It suddenly isn't our, isn't our fault anymore. It isn't our problem at all. And that would be a huge problem for a Catholic doctrine, right? Yes. Calvinists. That's much later. Mm. That's a good bit later. Mm. And you know, that, there's certainly some 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 uh, some issues See, that could be brought up with that. But we're not going to go into that quite yet. <laughs> so that's okay with you. Um, yeah, I mean, so they were they were determinist. They, the, the whole idea of Calvinism is the, is the notion that God already knows everything in advance, yeah. and therefore, you know, there is no true free will. There, the, he already knows who's to be saved and who's not to be saved. And that you know that's that and that is a, that is a, a sort of a, a, a Protestant idea that's very distinct, mm -hmm. um, and uh, it has its own issues. Um, I shall uh, you know bringing that up. I'm, gonna, I'm actually going to skip ahead to uh, to something else. There is a uh, guy named Moses uh, Maimonides, um, who is a, uh, a Jewish philosopher um, and theologian in, the, in Alexandria, about uh, right actually right around the time of uh, of Jesus, so right around you know the first century. Um, he wrote. This is about the deterministic uh, implications of an omniscient God. Does God know or does he not know that a certain individual will be good or bad? If thou sayest he knows, then it necessarily follows that man is compelled to act as God knew beforehand he would act. Otherwise, God's knowledge would be imperfect. So there's, yeah, there's some, there's some mental knots we can, we can sort of get ourselves in. And it's, you know, it's important to recognize that Aquinas sees that. He definitely sees that. And he is 
responding in order to sort of protect that doctrine, which to him is most important. It's part of it is, is the is the uh, is the epistemology of middle, of middle ages. The most important form uh, source of, of knowledge is revelation. Yeah, is direct revelation from God, and the sense input and logic and reason and inference, etc., comes much later. Like uh, you know, it, it, that's like much lower down. You know, it's imperfect compared. Your reason will never be revelation. Revelation is directly from God, and it is more perfect. So there's, a, there's an epistemology that's, that's implied in, in, uh, in Aquinas that gets undermined in the Protestant era, and as we'll see. Um, so so free will is almost actually a defense against that idea. Well, right? it's, it's, it's required, it's, 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 if, if basically if you assume the truth of, of uh, Catholic, doc Catholic doctrine and Christian doctrine in general, it follows from that. It is inferred, it must be the case if those other things are true. Sure. And if we assume that those things are true, free will must be the case. Uh, good question. Well, just like historically, uh, Thomas Aquinas, like maybe around a hundred years before, like Martin Luther and the Protestant Re Reformation. Um, well, he was uh, he was or in the twelve uh, hundreds. Oh, so twelve hundreds. Okay, I so thought you said thirteen hundreds. Thirteenth century. Thirteenth century, right? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, let's get into his uh, into his answers to the objections. I think the best way to the best way to do this is to have one person read the objection and the other person read the response. Uh, who wants to read the, the uh, Jamie, you want to read the uh, objections again? Yeah, sure. Who wants to read the uh, responses? Adrian, go for it. Mm -hmm. All right, so you open up to your reply to objection one, and you have your objection one. Objection one. It would seem that man has not free will, for whoever has free will does what he wills. But man does not what he wills, for it is written, Romans 719, for the good which I will I do not, but the evil which I will not that I do. Therefore, man has not free will. As we have said above, the sensitive appetite, though it obeys the reason, yet in a given case can resist by desiring what the reason forbids. This is therefore the good which man does not when he wishes, namely, not to desire against reason, as Augustine says. In other words, we can have an appetite that contradicts the rational soul, but the rational soul is ultimately in charge. Like in other words, we can have an impulse that's going to tell us to sin, but it is not required or determining that we are going to sin. He's very, very specific on that. Again, there's a defense of the, of, of the possibility of salvation in sin here. Continue. Objection two. Further, whoever has free will has in his power to will or not to will, to do or not to do. But this is not in man's power, for it is written, It is not of him that willeth, namely to will, nor of him that runneth, namely to run. Therefore, man has not free will. Those words of the apostle are not to be taken as though man does not wish or does not run with his free will, but because the free will is not sufficient thereto, unless it be moved and helped by God. In other words, part of this is, is going to this, this doctrine that the free will in that rational soul, that, that thing which can be separated and has been and will be again separated from the body, um, is created directly from God as the original cause, and therefore is created as free as well, right? Um, but that would not be the case if it was not for God, right? So in other words, that was the, that is that that cause, the ultimate free agent, God, creates freedom for humanity through that intercession. It's sometimes called grace, that sort of notion, right? Moving on. Objection three. Further. What is free is cause of itself, as the philosopher says. Therefore, what is moved by another is not free. But God moves the will, for it is written, The heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord. Uh, whithersoever, he shall, he, whithersoever he will, he shall turn it. And it is God who worketh in you, both to will and to accomplish. Therefore, man has not free will. Free will is the cause of its own movement, because by his free will, man moves himself to act. But it does not of necessity belong to liberty. That what is free should be the first cause of itself, as neither for one thing to be cause of another need it be the first cause. God, therefore, is the first cause, who moves causes both natural and voluntary. And just as by moving natural causes, he does not prevent their acts being natural, so by moving voluntary causes, he does not deprive their actions of being voluntary. But rather, he is the cause of this very thing in them, for he, oper um, for he operates in each thing according to its own nature. 
Now, on the one hand, this is exactly what I was saying for objection two, right? This idea of God is the first cause, imparting the ability for a voluntary cause. But it has something this is very cool and hidden in here. It's Aquinas acknowledging natural causes. I think this is all. I think I think he's also talking about it in terms of us. We have certain natural appetites. For instance, the desire for food. He acknowledges that this is a, essentially it is a, a motive. It is something that is helping to determine. But he, it is to him. It does not detract from the notion that man is still free to deny it, as in fasting, etc. Right. Continuing up. In other words, he's not one hundred. It's not like. He, Yes, you're perfectly free will all the time, mm -hmm. right? It implies that there's, uh, that there's at least some limits. Going on. Further, whoever has free will is master of his own actions, but man is not master of his own actions. For it is written, the way of a man is not his, neither is it in a man to walk. Therefore, man has not free will. Man's way is said not to be his in the execution of his choice, wherein he may be impeded whether he will or not. The choice itself, however, is in us, but pre presupposes the help of God. This actually goes back to uh, Sabrina's first uh, limitation on the will, as she said, right? This, uh, this notion that someone may stop you, right? What Aquinas is saying is that that does not at all impact whether you have free will or not, because the, f the freedom of will is the freedom of choice to act, and if you're stopped, that's, uh, that's, that's a whole other matter entirely. In other words, it, you know, once you begin to act and it, you can be stopped or not stopped, it does not diminish the fact that you have freedom of will. Um, sort of like the Stoics would later say that you know we have no command, you know, we have no control over the world. Or, or many of the Stoics were connected to uh, senators and, and uh, powerful figures, like Seneca, who was a, who was a tutor of a Roman emperor, and would uh, you know he, what they would say is that. There is, uh, you know, you can't control whether the emperor is going to suddenly not like you tomorrow and have you killed. All you can choose is how to face that fate. That's where your free will lies. And this is something very similar, um, I think, in that regard. Makes sense, makes sense right? Well, what if it's an internal conflict? That's a whole other matter. That's a different, that's a different uh, objection entirely. And we're going to get m much more into that. That's actually much more interesting to me, I think, uh, than yeah. the external thing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we, have, we, have weeks, we have weeks of that one. Uh, <laughs> moving on to the last objection. Just objection five. Further, the philosopher says, according as each one is, such does the end seem to him. But it is not in our power to be of one quality or another, for this comes to us from nature. Therefore, it is natural to us to follow some particular end, and therefore we are not free in so doing. Okay. Quality in man is of two kinds, natural and adventitious. Adventitious. It's like adventitious. A, it's another word for accidental or like uh, based on circumstance. Adventitious, thank you. Now the natural quality may be in the intellectual part or in the body and its powers. For the very, uh, from the very fact, therefore, that man is such by virtue of a natural quality, which is in the intellectual part, he naturally desireth his last end, which is happiness. Which desire indeed is a natural desire, and is not subject to free will, as is clear from what uh, we have said above. But on the part of the body and its powers, man may be such by virtue of a natural quality, inasmuch as he is of such a temperament or disposition due to any impression whatsoever produced by corporeal causes, which cannot affect the intellectual part, since it is not the act of a corporeal organ. And such as a man is by virtue of a corporeal quality, such also does his end seem to him, because from such a disposition a man is inclined to choose or reject something. But these inclinations are subject to the judgment of reason, which the lower appetite obeys, as we have said. Wherefore, this is in no way uh, pre uh, sorry. Uh, prejudicial. Prejudicial. Thank you. Prejudicial to free will. The advantageous qualities are habits and passions, by virtue of which a man is inclined to one thing rather than to another. And yet even these inclinations are subject to the judgment of reason. Such qualities, too, are subject to reason, as it is in our power either to acquire them, whether by causing them or disposing ourselves to them, or to reject them. And so there is nothing in this that is repugnant to free will. So there's a lot, quite a bit there. Right? 
And some of this co goes into Aquinas' metaphysics, in particular his notion of, uh, of the way creation works. Right? The idea of uh, it, it is not necessary that God create the world. It is a result of his free choice on the one hand, and also of its natural goodness, that the world is therefore um, good. Evil is considered to be a matter of accident. It is something that is allowed, not caused. Right, and much in the way that uh, darkness is not is is not caused, it is a simple privation. It's a lack. There is a notion here that that evil, of course, in 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 this doctrine, in, in, and certainly in Thomas Aquinas, is not a substance of itself. It is something that is a simple lack. Similarly, um, a apparent lack of free will will also appear a very similar kind of way. What he's saying in in this particular section is that the ultimate will intellectual, if the intellectual soul of man is towards his best happiness. And ultimately that means God, who is the ultimate good. That the, that the human reason, the human will naturally heads towards that deity, towards the source of all goodness. But at the same time, because it has impressed with a corporal body, it has also sensory appetites. And those sensory appetites can be in conflict, right? And can also create an appearance of a very much a natural state. For instance, um, let's say, you know, I happened to grow up in, you know, went to high school in the 90s and I uh, got really into Guns N' Roses and Metallica because of that <laughs> moment, right? I happened to be into that, that whole thing. So this is, this, this is not, you know, according to Aquinas, a deep part of my soul. It has nothing to do with that intellectual body. It is simply a matter of my habits and passions that come from the impressions of living this life and are essentially accidental. They are secondary, right? And the will towards enjoyment of those things is simply a, uh, a, a more specific manifestation of the general will towards the good. And that said, that will can be misunderstood, right? It is, it is uh, a, a person may mistake their own happiness and what will make them happy, right? We do this all the time, right? We think that we're going to enjoy something and then it actually happens. It's like, mm. not so much. Or worse, it ends up, we think it's gonna make us happy and it makes us miserable. It's actually the opposite of what we, of what we want. You know, we, that kind of short-term thinking, right? You know, cigarettes seem like a great idea until they're not, right? Until you suddenly wake up and realize it's a terrible idea, right? Uh, it's that sort of short-term kind of thinking, and that's kind of where, where, he's, where he's getting at in this regard. And what he's saying is that those natural predispositions that come, he mostly says they're coming from without. He does not allow for a lot of that to come from within. Um, at least not, not all of it, anyway. Not most of it, even that none of this is repugnant to free will, that none of this limits the fact, because ultimately all of those things are in the sensitive appetite, that middle ground, and the reason stands above them and with the ability to override them always. This is central to his doctrine. What do we think of that? Sounds hard. Shame. Can the reason overwhelm everything else? Can your reason guide everything perfectly and freely? No. Decided. It's boring. <laughs> it would just mean yeah. perfect discipline. Yeah. Yeah. Which is yeah. extremely difficult. Yeah, no rebels. No means. Reason. So, I mean, like, is it. It's important to recognize also that it's not like logic. We're talking about the that which reasons, not reason itself, not like, you know, logic and abstraction, that sort of thing. It's. It's that within us which is doing the reasoning. The part of us that is capable of that reasoning. is what he's getting at. The, the intellectual self. This is, by the way, I know a few of you guys have you know, done yoga teacher trainings and have gotten to uh, Sankhya metaphysics. It's just where I'm going. Right, yeah. So the buddhi in that, in that sense, which is the, the pretty much the highest part of the mind, mm -hmm. is called the intellectual right, mm -hmm. part. And it's very similar to Aquinas here. It's saying that the buddhi has that same freedom of will uh, in fact, in the, in the doctrine of karma, which is very much a deterministic doctrine, right, where everything causes the next thing, and in fact, your previous life causes your current life and your body and all that kind of stuff, it is still said that the buddhi can override those forces. That we can will, essentially, with that buddhi, with the intellectual part, to overcome those things. Whether this is true is a, very, is a big, big question that we're going to get into in a moment. But it's important, I think it's good to realize that a lot of pre-modern philosophies were in agreement on this point. That the reason was up here. There's something missing also here. 
something really important that we take for granted. A doctrine and an idea that we're going to head toward, this, this course is heading towards. Unconscious. The unconscious. There is no conception of the unconscious yet. And there wasn't in early yoga philosophy, and there wasn't here either with Aquinas. So this is this is a question like about what the forces of the unconscious are and that kind of stuff, and that's going to be a lot of where, sort of where we're heading with this this idea of what this will is. So we're going to head into our next group. Um, I hope everyone's okay with staying till maybe a little after seven thirty. Um, the preliminary remarks took, a, took us a little, long, a little longer than I anticipated. Um, we're going to kind of we're going to jump into uh, we're going to jump ahead a few hundred years, right? Um, this is after or, or this is pretty much after the beginning of the Protestant Reformation and the beginnings of really, of, of people questioning these doctrines and starting to really start to sort of take everything apart um, and look at what's going on here. And it's also the beginning of the, of the possibility for slightly more skeptical philosophies and uh, atheistic philosophies even. Um, it's not, it wasn't necessarily popular at these times to, to have those uh, opinions, but it was more possible. And people were publishing very skeptical works um, the first I want to get into, and um, we're just going to touch on him almost very, very, very briefly, is Thomas Hobbes and his book, The Leviathan. Thomas Hobbes lived from 1588 to 1679, so a good couple hundred years later. Uh, who wants to read Hobbes here? It's a very short paragraph. Anyone who hasn't read before? <coughs> Go for it, Sabrina. <coughs> In deliberation, the last appetite or aversion immediately adhering to the action or to the omission thereof is that we call the will. The act, not the faculty of willing. And beasts that have deliberation must necessarily necessarily also have will. The definition of the will given commonly by the schools that is a rational appetite is not good. For if it were, then could there be no voluntary act against reason. The schools, what he's talking about, that the schools with a capital S, uh, or sometimes you hear this, the schoolmen, um, are the philosophers that were um, either followers of Aquinas or slightly predating him. These notions of these uh, of these philosophical schools of thought, mostly in the Middle Ages. So you hear the schoolmen think Aquinas first. Uh, so he's he's criticizing Aquinas directly here. Right? Um, he's saying what well, his argument here is that the will, the act of willing, is the very last appetite or aversion that causes an action. So you can deliberate, say I want to do this, maybe I want to do this, and then there's one that causes you to act, that's the will, <laughs> essentially is what he's saying. It's at the end of the story, it's the very last thing, and he's saying it is not necessarily the rational appetite at work, it can be whatever causes the action, including the more sensory appetite. And he says that that is, that is the will as well, and basically he's questioning the notion that the will is determined, or is necessarily bound up with the idea of a rational soul. Someone, a follower of his, takes it a little bit further, and that's going to be David Hume, who we're going to go into much more at length than Hobbes. Is that, <coughs> is that kind of saying, basically, he's denying that there's any distinguishing between, like, like Aquinas was kind of saying that free will is the special clause that leads us to do actions, and when we, when we, when we act based off of this special clause of free will, then that's exhibiting that we have this capacity to will things freely. Is, he, is, is Hobbes kind of saying that there's nothing special about that clause. It's not different from the other clauses. Yeah, that's kind of where he, he's, he's criticizing the sort of the hierarchy of it yeah. a little bit. And he's beginning to question it. He's not, he doesn't go into it, into, into it a whole lot. Hume really is, 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 is the one I want to use as an example here. He's going to take this a little bit further. So we'll leave, uh, we'll leave <coughs> Hobbes behind and move on to, on to Hume. Now Hume, a um, little, little bit later, um, he was in the, uh, what do you call it, uh, it's the 1600s, 1700s. And, uh, He's a Scottish, he's a Scotsman, and uh, he's often considered one of the, uh, the greatest philosophers to write in English. So we actually are not reading a translation here, we're reading his words, and sometimes the spellings are a little funky, just go <laughs> with it. Um, but, because, uh, you know, modern spelling comes in the modern day. So, Hume is an interesting fellow. He's all about getting into the idea of what is reason, how important is it, um, and what about the other side of that, passions, right? Mm -hmm. And basically, what he starts to say is that Reason, like a lot of the schoolmen, a lot of you know Aquinas and his followers, uh, and Descartes who would follow him, um, would say that reason exists for its own sake, and this is something that uh, it goes back to uh, to Aristotle. Aristotle said that the highest questions, the most important things a philosopher does, is not practical wisdom, but theoretical wisdom. 
theoretical knowledge. In other words, useless stuff. The less useful it is, the less noble, right? We get this sort of this, this, this old-fashioned notion that comes in here. And what Hume says is that reason is always for something. It doesn't exist on its own. It is used for a practical purpose. And he's going to argue that it follows something else and isn't leading the show. So here's a quote from uh, Hume that's going to tell us about what reason is. Reason is the discovery of truth and falsehood. Truth of falsehood or falsehood consists in agreement or disagreement either to the real relations of ideas or to real existence and matter of fact. Whatever, therefore, is not susceptible to this agreement or disagreement is capable of being true or false and can never be an object of our reason. Now, tis evident our passions, volitions, and actions are not susceptible of any such agreement or disagreement, being original facts and realities, complete in themselves and implying no reference to other passions, volitions, or actions. It is impossible, therefore, that they can be pronounced either true or false, be either contrary or conformable to reason. That makes sense? That's what he's saying here? He's saying that reason is about relations between facts. Is this true? Is this not true? Is this something that may work out? You know, we're sort of reasoning out that something may be true or maybe not true. We talk about free will on those, on those lines. But what he's saying is that our motivations, our, our passions, our emotions, uh, our, our desires, our actions even, are not susceptible to whether they're true or false. They are factually present and true. They are the original facts of experience. Now, he's what you call an, empir an empiricist. He believed that, that we can't reason out the truth of the world, but that we only have to, we can only observe it. And this is obviously has huge implications for modern science, right? Um, and changes things dramatically, rather than, because uh, keep in mind, Aquinas was not an observer, necessarily. That wasn't where he was, he was, he was dealing with the Bible and dealing with Aristotle and all these other commentaries and the Apocrypha and all that sort of stuff, and was reasoning because this reason to him was a divine thing in itself and could penetrate to truth directly, in fact, was the only thing that could go to truth because the senses do not reveal the truth of God, right? Well, Hume is saying the opposite. He's saying that that, is that, is, that, that leads to fallacy. It leads to limitations. The only way we can really decide, the only way we can know anything is with our senses and observing directly. It's important to realize also that Hume was uh, probably an atheist, and this was a very unusual thing. Um, he had to publish his book on religion posthumously. He wasn't willing to publish it in his life because it would have ruined his political career. Yeah. He was a diplomat and one of the things. He wrote a history of England. It's massive. Um, so this is the guy that we're, we're going to jump into now. So who wants to... Uh, uh, also, I'm going to give you one more, one more little <coughs> thing. This is a little snippet. Uh, liberty or chance, in terms of uh, will, is nothing but the want of that determination and a certain looseness we feel with regards to our will. Sort of can imagine that we can do anything. The looseness of thought. Now, let's get into him a little more properly. Who wants to start with this? We, 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 you don't have to read the whole thing. So just the first, this first block of text. Who wants to jump in? Please. Nothing is more usual, usual in philosophy and even in common life than to talk of the combat of passion and reason to give the preference to reason and to assert that men are only so far virtuous as they conform themselves to its dictates. Every rational creature, tis said, is obliged to regulate his actions by reason. And if any other motive or principle challenge the direction of his conduct, he ought to oppose it till it be entirely subdued or at least brought to a conformity with that superior principle. On this method of thinking, the greatest part of moral philosophy, ancient and modern, seems to be founded. The eternity, invariableness, and divine origin of the former have been displayed to the best advantage. The blindness, unconstancy, and deceitfulness of the latter have been as strongly insisted on in order to shrew, shoo? Show. 
Pardon? Sure. Sure. <laughs> That's a spelling so funky. The fallacy of all this philosophy I shall endeavor to prove first that reason alone can never be a motive to any action of the will, and secondly, that it can never oppose passion in the direction of the will. Powerful statement. Wow. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. It's a very different turn of philosophy here. And Hume is only the beginning of this, but he's uh, he's not even may not even necessarily be the beginning of this, but he puts it down very plainly, and I really I really dig him uh, because of that. He's kind of straightforward with this. But what we what we got here is we have this passion and will. Now, passion is, is a word. It's kind of old fashioned way of talking about emotions. It's more emotion is a more modern way of putting it. But passion is a, is a, is a cool way too. Um, it it implies a lot of a huge range of our emotions and desires as well. So it's not just emotion, but desire, right? The act of wanting something, the act of being called out into the world and, and having motivating forces, right? And he's basically saying that those motives are before reason and rule reason, and that is the way it actually is. Um, so, moving on. Let's go ahead. And of course, he, he, he does, uh, what do you call it, uh, note that everything before this period of time, this, the, the beginning of the Enlightenment, the opposite was considered to be the case. All of those sort of, the, all the pre-modern philosophies tend to agree, whether it's in India, whether it's in China, whether it's in uh, the West. So, uh, who wants to read the next paragraph? Sure. Go for it. The scholastic doctrine of free will, which... The scholastic is Aquinas. The scholastic doctrine of free will, which indeed enters very little into common life and has but small influence on our vulgar and popular ways of thinking. According to this doctrine, motives deprive us not of free will, nor to take away our power of performing or forbearing any action. But according to common notions, a man has no power, where very considerable motives lie betwixt him and the satisfaction of his desires, and determine him to forbear that which he wishes to perform. I do not think I have fallen into my enemy's power when I see him pass me in the streets with a sword by his side, while I am unprovided of any weapon. I know that the fear of the civil magistrate is as strong a restraint as any of iron, and that I am in perfect safety, as if he were chained or imprisoned. Now if we compare these two cases, that of a person who has a very strong motives of interest or safety to forbear any action, and that of another who lies under no such obligation, we shall find that the only known difference betwixt them lies in this that the former case we conclude from our past experience that the person never will perform that action, and in the latter that he possibly or probably will perform it. Nothing is more fluctuating and inconstant on many occasions than the will of man, nor is there anything but strong motives which can give us an absolute certainty in pronouncing, pronouncing concerning any of his future actions. We can predict the actions of another if we know their motives, don't we? Almost as if they're caused. And that's kind of a key, key sort of a linchpin to this to this notion, that if we were totally free, we'd actually be a hell of a lot less predictable, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, and that there are certain there are motivations here, and of course there is that there are, are inhibitions to our will that are going to be felt as of the will themselves. The idea, for instance, oh yeah, I, you know, uh, you know, if someone is you know has a sword and they're your enemy, and they theoretically could put an end to you right here, they won't, because there's a bigger motive. There's another thing. There's part of the passion of fearing the magistrate, fearing the police, essentially, uh, and fearing being locked up, etc., is, is going to inhibit you as strongly as if you were actually physically incapable of doing it. Right? This, this, this may go to you know, sort of play out to other things. You might um, sort of theoretically be free to take any action right, tomorrow. Right? I'd say you know, tomorrow you, you might uh, fly out to Switzerland and, uh, and ski the slopes. But probably you have other motives keeping you here. And you might say, yeah, that'd be nice, but you won't, right? And there's so many things that, that, that you might will yourself to do or wish to do, I should say, another way to put it, that just won't happen, right? Because there's, there's some other factor, there's another internal factor inhibiting you. So we get this beginning of this recognition that there are other factors both within and without that, uh, that are going to inhibit that. And we'd like to read the next section. Go for it. I believe we may assign three following reasons for the prevalence of the doctrine of liberty, however absurd it may be in the one sense, and unintelligible in any other. First, after we have performed any action, 
Though we confess we were influenced by particular views and motives, it is difficult for us to persuade ourselves that we were governed by necessity, and that uh, was utterly impossible for us to have acted otherwise. The idea of necessity seeming to imply something of force and violence and constraint of which we are not sensible. Okay, pause. So, here's, here's, he's going to give us three reasons why people believe in free will, even though he's saying that's, that's clearly not purely the case. The first reason he gives us is right here. This idea that we don't feel unfree. We are not necessarily sensible to the many motivations that we have for something. Again, this is before the notion of the unconscious, but we can see how it can derive from this philosophy. That there may be things about ourselves that we don't know. There are motives under the surface, etc. Um, we might, like, because if the idea of necessity, the idea that your cause, that your actions are determined, implies a force from without, but you don't feel that. And yet, I think we can agree that it's there. There's something there. So you still have to go about the action. Even if somebody's standing over there with a sword saying, if you don't do this, I'm going to kill you, you still have to will it. Well, yeah, you still have to, be, um, you still have to will it, sure. You, you still have to make that, that, that choice. Yeah. But chances are you're not going to, you know, you're, you're going you're gonna to do what they say or you're not going to do what they say based on your own motivations. Yeah. That's the strongest motivations. So continue with the second, Jim. Secondly, there is a false sensation or experience, even of the liberty of indifference, the idea of acting without motive, not apparently caring about the result, which is regarded as an argument for its real existence. We feel that our actions are subject to the will on most occasions, and imagine we feel that the will itself is subject to nothing, because when a denial of it, when by a denial of it we are provoked to try, we feel that it moves easily every way and produces an image of itself even on that side on which it did not settle. This image or faint motion we pers we persuade ourselves could have been completed into the thing itself because should that be denied we find upon second trial that it can but these efforts are all in vain and whatever capricious and irregular actions we may perform as the desire of showing our liberty is the sole motive of our actions we can never free ourselves from the bonds of necessity we may imagine we feel a liberty within ourselves but a spectator can commonly infer our actions from our motives and character so, I like this one, it's my favorite one. <laughs> because it's so, it's so true, right? It's a, it's, it's a clear thing, like, of course I have free will, I can think of all these different things I can do. <laughs> but we don't actually do those things. You can think of them. There's a freedom of thought, very much. I was sort of, oh, I can imagine myself, doing, yeah, you know, you, know, you know, Dave says that, uh, you know, uh, that you know, Jamie's not gonna come over here and punch me in the face. He doesn't have the free will to do that. So Jamie gets up and he comes over to me and does it. He goes and just decks me right here. Why? What is? But, but there's a motivation here. It is that it is he is trying to prove to himself the liberty of free will. I wasn't just sick of Dave. <laughs> As the case may be. But there's this there is this idea that we can we can attempt to prove it to ourselves because we can say, well, of course I am free. I can do this. Let me go and do that. As soon as you're challenging someone, but now the cause is the Their person challenge. questioning them. <laughs> right? It does not prove anything about the will yeah. being actually free. Moving on to the third and very important reason. A third reason why the doctrine of liberty has generally been better received in the world than its antagonist proceeds from religion, which has been very unnecessarily interested in this question. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me what you really feel. Yes. There is no method of reasoning more common and yet no more blameable. None more blameable. No, none more blameable than in philosophical debates to endeavor to refute, by, refute any hypothesis by a pretext of its dangerous consequences to religion and morality. And this is he's very much reacting to this time. Because in this time, he could not, it was very difficult to question, it's very unpopular to question this sort of thing. Um, it's like it could even be dangerous, right, um, for him to do that. And what he's saying here is that, like Aquinas, if we deny free will, we deny all of these other things. There's a lot of, th but for instance, if we say that there's, that there's no free will, if we come on straight on a pure determinist kind of side of things, what about jail and punishment and justice? Is anyone really culpable for their actions? Do we, ha we have to reconsider not only sin and salvation, but our entirety of our 
idea about punishment and justice and that we're actually getting at some truth of things and that the person who is going to jail deserves it in some way. But if all their actions are caused and none of it is from free will, then they don't deserve any of it. And suddenly we have a very different notion of justice and punishment. So clearly there's, there, and there's, this is an, an important thing to consider. Um, and for instance, one of the reasons um, that there has been attempts at reform of the prison system is because, let's say, in the 19th century or earlier, it was really about punishment. You threw, like someone did something bad, you throw them in a hole. You know what I mean? And they're lucky if they get bread and milk <coughs> because they're a bad person. <laughs> they made that call. Now we look at it a little bit more like, Okay, well, what about rehabilitation? What about you know considering what's going on here? We're trying to change these people. We're not trying to punish them, and we might take, account, take into account their circumstances. This comes out of psychology, which you get a lot of, you know a lot of witnesses will come and talk about the psychology of their client and saying that oh well this person you know was doing it because of this and they were reacting to their circumstances as much as what happened here. This was just the straw that brought the cows back or whatever, right? So basically, it is a, a thing that will keep us from accepting any determinism of our, in, our, in our psyche is these fears about what it implies for everything else. Does it mean we have to rethink our world? Because there's an assumption of free will because of the first two of his causes, the first two reasons why he says free will is so prevalent. And the third is that, well, if we, ex if we deny the first two and say that there is no free will, then it would make us have to rethink everything. Because it is our, it is, I mean this in a, in, I don't mean this in a, in a negative way. The naive view is free will. In other words, we all think we're free if we are not taught otherwise or we don't think about it. I think that every like young kid thinks they're free will, right? Yeah. I wouldn't be surprised. I wouldn't be surprised, right? Um, so there's some things holding us back from this, and, and Hume faces them very directly. We could never put people in jail based off of their causes. Like, imagine if everybody who was predisposed towards doing something bad would just like, go to jail. Yeah. Well, basically, all of this is saying, like, mm -hmm. any outside cause can't be free will. But you have the will to interpret that however you want. So, like, if something else is affecting the way that you do something, like, a lot of this is saying, like, then if it's an external force, then it can't be coming from you. Therefore, it's not your free will. It's someone else's. Well, it's, it's saying that your, your motives may be determined by someone else. Like, you know, if you, your parents, for instance, your values that you inherited um, can certainly be a determining factor about what you do or do not do. I mean, what he's, what he's, what he's really getting at is, is that there is both internal and external constraints to free will. Although I think, I think he would follow Aquinas, you know, sort of Aquinas to say essentially it's really an internal constraint for the most part mm -hmm. because it's... You know, you can still act and be stopped, and that doesn't really negate your free will. It, 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 uh, it negates your free action, which is a whole other question. We definitely don't have free action, right? I mean, I can't it's fly. Choice, I right? can't fly, so I don't have no free action. Yeah. But we do have, <laughs> that's a very different situation. So we're gonna, so to sort of step back from that, we're gonna say that when we're talking about free will, we're not talking about the action and the result of the action. We're talking about the cause of the action and the ability to act at least to start the action, right? Whether the action goes to completion is a whole other matter, right? Because that depends on your circumstances, again. But the, the will behind it, the motivation, is really what we're, what we're focused on. But what about yeah, the way you respond to, to the, to the, the that's motives? That's also part of it, yeah. I think it's really what you, if you can't always do it, then it can't be free will. So Always do what? Whatever it is. If you can't always do it every second, whenever you want, then it's not free will because something's restricting you. So the only thing you can always do is like think and interpret things and perceive things. So that's really it. And the question is, of course, whether those things, whether those thoughts and perceptions are caused as well. Yeah. <laughs> and we're going to get more and more into that over the next few weeks. Yeah, we're, this, is, this is a deep rabbit hole. So we're have some fun. But let's finish up with Hume for today. So um, picking up uh, the next one, we're going to, wants to be a quick reader. Sure. Go for it. Tis, ob that we're t tis obvious. Yeah. Tis obvious that when we have the prospect of pain or pleasure from any object, we feel a consequent emotion or aversion or propensity, and are carried to avoid or embrace what will give us this uneasiness or satisfaction. Tis also obvious that this emotion rests not here, but making us cast our view on every side, comprehends whatever objects are connected with the original one by the relation of its cause and effect. 
Here, then, reasoning takes place to discover this relation, and according by our, as our reasoning varies, our actions receive a subsequent variation. But it is evident in, this, evident in this case that the impulse arises not from reason, but is only directed by it. It is from the prospect of pain or pleasure that the aversion of, or propensity arises toward any object, and these emotions extend themselves to the causes and effects of that object, as they are pointed out to us by reason and experience. Where the objects themselves do not affect us, their connection can never give them any influence, and tis plain that as reasoning is nothing but the discovery of this connection, it cannot be by, by its means that the objects are able to affect us. Good. Pause. So, he is criticizing reason as being the impetus. Right? He's saying, you know, we, we, I think we, we think we'd agree at this point that there are motives that are determining will. And what he's now beginning to argue, which is going to be very important for us as we progress over the next few weeks, is that reason is not capable of being a cause. Only the passions. Essentially this. Your reason will help you solve a problem by observing and making connections between things and getting some knowledge through that. Right? But the desire to, cause the, to, to solve a problem is not from reason. For instance, you've got kids. Okay. Is your motivation towards them rational? No. <laughs> no. Not even close. But, but in the solving of the problems that arise from having kids and, and, and dealing with them day to day, you use your reason all the time. Essentially, <laughs> what do you do? What am I going to feed feet. them today? What am I like, based on what I have? And when I got to go to the store, and I got to take care of this, and I got to take care of that, and get them to these places, and blah blah blah, right? So you have all these sort of, uh, you know, like the, the, the planning part mm -hmm. is from reason, mm -hmm. but it's caused by the emotions, the desires to better your kids, mm -hmm. and to you know, and to nurture them, and those things are not a product of you didn't think them out. Right? They're just yeah. there. They're prior, essentially, is what he's saying. So he's arguing that rather than what Aquinas is saying, that the reason is prior to everything else, that the passions are prior to reason. And that is essentially, that is the essence of, of, of what he's going with here. So, continue on from there, Mark. Since reason alone can never produce any action or give rise to volition, I infer that the same faculty is as incapable of preventing volition or of disputing the preference with any passion or emotion. This consequence is necessary. Tis impossible reason could have the latter effect of preventing volition, but by giving an impulse in a contrary direction to our passion, and that impulse, had it operated alone, would have been able to produce volition. Nothing can oppose or retard the impulse of passion, but a contrary impulse. So, he goes a step further, He's saying not only does reason not cause your motives, it can't stop them, not on its own. Now you might reason out a reason not to do something, but if it is not combined with a passion, a, a sort of a strong motivation to do the other thing. For instance, you might say, I really, like, I don't want to do this thing that I've been doing. I want to stop smoking, right? Right, let's say. And there's this fight within you. There's this impulse to do it, and the reason says, gives you all these reasons why you shouldn't. But if it's just reasons, you're never going to stop smoking. If those reasons are not backed up by, let's say, a real desire for health, a desire for to, you know, let's say maybe, you know, maybe you have a new uh, significant other who doesn't smoke, right, and you want to keep them <laughs> in your life. So there's this other motivation. There's something underneath that. The reason can give you cause, can, can, can sort of play out why you might not, but unless any of those particularly stands out to you as really important, you're not going to choose those things. Okay. Um, I like to give an example in terms of this, of uh, my ice cream shop example. You may have heard this before, yeah. right? You walk into it. You, I give you a coupon it's for one free scoop of gelato or ice cream, whatever kind you like. Right? Whatever kind you like. And this is a particular place that you have gone. Um, you've gone, you gone there before, and they have 20 flavors. And you had every single one of them, so you know what they taste like. Novelty is outside of the question. But you know, because you've tasted them all, that you don't like 10 of them at all. Five, you're, they're okay, but five you really like. And of those five, three are your, uh, are your total, prep, your, really, the, your favorite ones, and one is your absolute favorite. Which do you pick? Are you going to choose those ten that you don't like, that you don't like the flavor of, like licorice or whatever, in my case? Um, <laughs> right? um, no, you're not going to choose those. No, you don't like it. Now, free will will say, like Aquinas would say, that you can reason that out and pick that thing. 
right? You have really truly, truly have a choice of 20, but you don't have a choice of 20. That choice is limited to 10 right off the bat and probably five, maybe even three. And really, it's only one scoop, but you don't have anything else. You're probably gonna pick the one that's your favorite. So all that is sort of before that. Similarly, you would have, in order for you to not choose your favorite, you have to have another impulse, a desire to do something else. For instance, you might say, I have eaten so much ice cream in the past week, I feel so gross. I don't want everyone to have ice cream again, so I'm not going to have anything. It requires a motivation to not, to deny that. Okay. And then last, most important, this is a very famous quote of his, please. Reason is, and ought only, to be the slave of the passions, and can never pretend to any other office than to serve and obey them. A passion is an, ex is an original existence, or, if you will, a modification of existence, and contains not only representative quality, not any, not any, not any representative quality, which renders it a copy of any other existence or modification. When I am angry, I am actually possessed with the passion, and in that emotion have no more reference to any other object than, I am, than when I am thirsty, or sick, or more than five foot high. It is impossible, therefore, that this passion can be opposed by or be contradictory to truth and reason, since this contradiction consists in the disagreement of ideas considered as copies with those objects which they represent. In other words, reason, it, it, the way it works is by representing something to us. It makes a mental copy of it in your head, and you juggle these, these in, in relation to each other. That's what, that's what reason is about, right? It represents the abstraction of, from the experience. You have sensory input, and you abstract that into, into thinking it out in your head. Passions don't work that way. They are immediate. They are the direct way of putting it, right? So, to, as, as Hume puts it, um, what do you call it? Uh, it is an original existence. And as we'll get into next week, Schopenhauer will agree with him very strongly that these passions are this original, reasonable notion. Um, to sort of close out with this idea of Hume, let me give you a couple, a couple other things he says. As this applies to morality, since morals, therefore, have an influence on the actions and affections, there can be a, a motive, a cause, right? It follows that they cannot be derived from reason. And because reason alone, as we have already proved, can never have any such influence, morals excite passions and produce and or prevent actions. Reason of itself is utterly impotent in this, in this particular. The rules of morality, therefore, are not the conclusions of our reason. Mm -hmm. This is interesting, because he's not denying morality by any stretch. He's just saying that it isn't, where, it isn't coming from where Aquinas thinks it is. It's a matter of feeling, right? And we feel that, right? When we feel morally outraged, it is not a rational, thought-out process. Mm -hmm. it's just, we feel it, and then we think about why. It comes after the fact. But enough reasoning can determine Passion. Yes. Right. Yeah. Well, because you're, but then again, you're responding to it, and there's usually a, there's a motive there. What mm -hmm. Hume is saying is that he's not saying that reason can't do anything. It's just that it doesn't do anything. Primary. Yeah, without passion alongside it. I think he'll actually say that here as well. By liberty, then, we mean only a power of acting or not acting according to the ter determinations of the will. That is, if we choose to remain at rest, we may. If we choose to move, we may also. All laws being founded on rewards and punishment is supposed as a fundamental principle that these motives have regular and uniform influence on the mind and both produce the good and prevent evil actions. We may give to this influence what name we please, but as is usually conjoined with the action, it must be esteemed as a cause and be looked at as an instance of that necessity, which we should here establish. In other words, punishment and rewards are powerful motives. Yeah. <laughs> right? And so essentially, the, the situation is unchanged, just the description of it. And that, I think, is where we end for today. Thank you guys so much. You're welcome. Thank you, Dave. Uh, Thank you. We're going to pick up next week with uh, Schopenhauer. I think we'll probably have him for two weeks, and we're going to get into some yogic philosophy next time as well, because Schopenhauer was the very first of the Western philosophers to engage with uh, the Gita and the Upanishads and all that kind of good stuff. So thanks a lot, guys. I hope you enjoy. Thank you.